Hello, everyone, and welcome to Face Turn with Candice Cordelia. I'm your host, Candice Cordelia. It's great to virtually see you all today. And it's also great that we are still continuing our wrestling series in terms of the roles of wrestling managers here for PWI. I am so, so honored to have this particular guest on the show today. I've been following her career for quite some time. We are colleagues, and this is actually the first time that we are meeting at least virtually. Soon it will be in person, but either way, I am so lucky to have her on the show today. You most likely have seen her managing, I mean, let's face it, managing a stable of champions from GCW down on currently to NWA. She is a columnist. She is the 2021 QWI Pro Wrestling Personality of the Year. She's an MC. She's an award-winning drag queen performer. I mean, the list goes on and on, but that'll take up the whole entirety of the interview. So I'm going to stop now and introduce you to the one and only Polio Del Mar. Polio, how's it going? I'm very well, Candace. Polio Del Mar, Manager of Champions, Champion of Managers, your 2021 QWI award-winning pro wrestling personality of the year as voted by readers of Outsports.com, pro wrestling illustrated columnist and contributor. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, it's a pleasure having you here. I mean, I am such a fan of your work, Polio. I've seen you all over the country virtually that is, but you are doing your thing. And especially in 2022, you really set the bar high for pro wrestling managers. So I had to have you on the show for this special series that we're having here at PWI. I think it is long overdue that the art and role of professional wrestling managers is spotlighted. So I appreciate you giving due diligence to the current crop of professional wrestling managers who follow in the footsteps of legends and icons like the Bobby the Brain Heenans, the um, Jimmy Hart's, people like Sherry Martell and Luna who are my personal idols and inspirations. So thank you for doing it and thank you for having me. You're so very welcome. And having stated that, you mentioned, you know, a handful of icons that a lot of people, a lot of wrestling fans have grown up watching and loving and, and wanting mm -hmm. to emulate. So the first question that I have for you, Polio, is exactly how did your journey as a wrestling fan begin for you? It started very young. I, I started um, falling in love with professional wrestling when I was about eight years old. And I wanted to... Um, pursue that dream of professional wrestling. And I think it's very important because of the topic, but to make note that I never wanted to grow up and be a professional wrestler per se. I always, from the very beginning, was infatuated with and in love with the artistry that came with the wrestling manager. And that's the role that I dreamed of and felt destined to pursue. So since the age of about eight, um, I was a fan of the territory wrestling and the, the managers were so rich back then. There were so many and they were so varied. And then of course, as the explosion of popularity with WWF at the time happened, I followed that as well, but always wrestling managers were my love. Mm, that's very fascinating. And thank you for clarifying the fact that you grew up not wanting to be a wrestling manager. So how did that journey exactly? No, I did work? want to be a wrestling manager. That was the only yeah. thing I wanted to be. Ah, never a wrestler, always the manager. Never a wrestler. Exactly. I'm very glad you noted that because a lot of people would assume, okay, maybe it didn't work out that you wanted to do the wrestling. So then you jumped into wrestling managers and it's not quite often that you hear people saying, no, I actually wanted to be a wrestling manager. So how did that journey kick off for you on the managing front within the independent circuit, getting to where you are right now? It's been a long and winding road. And one of the things that I've discovered firsthand is that sometimes life intervenes and it takes you in a different path, right? So as a child, I grew up wanting to be a wrestling manager and a wrestling journalist. It was my lifelong dream to be a pro wrestling manager and to write for Pro Wrestling Illustrated, contribute to Pro Wrestling Illustrated. P.S. I'm living my dream. So it took many years to do that though, Candace, because life had a way of intervening. I got very involved um, initially in the world of professional wrestling a very long time ago as an undergraduate in college. And I had a couple of opportunities to be a manager of professional wrestlers in Northeastern Ohio, which is where I attended college. But 
I just did not feel confident and comfortable with myself at the time. And I also didn't feel confident and comfortable with the environment that I was in. So um, then for a, a period of time, about two years, it transitioned over to where I was doing commentary on those same shows where initially I was going to be a pro wrestling manager. And the commentary comes very naturally. I have a degree in broadcasting, darling. I can do all of that. But then I moved when I moved to California, all of that got set aside for a very long time. But what I tell people quite often is that if you hold on to your dreams long enough, um, sometimes the world evolves to catch up with where you are and it allows the two things to reconvene, right? So the world changed, I changed. And when we came back together, it was a perfect fusion because the manager of champions, Poet Omar was born. And that was about six years ago. I've been playing this character for much longer, but six years in the world of professional wrestling. So that is the long and short of it. Oh, wow. So you stated that, you know, your dreams were kind of set aside for a bit. When you moved to California, you were doing a lot with the media, especially in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and, and really raising your status there and getting to a point where people recognized you and knew who you were. And then you got back eventually into wrestling. What was the specific moment in which that happened where you were able to dive back into the industry and really get your career in motion? There, there was one specific moment. I was writing for the Huffington Post. I was a columnist for the Huffington Post and I was doing celebrity interviews. So I was interviewing people like Lady Gaga and Kelly, Kelly Clarkson and these big name celebrities, Nicolas Cage, whoever. And at one point in time, I, this is a true story. I interviewed Stone Cold Steve Austin. He was in a film and I interviewed Stone Cold Steve Austin. And during the course of that interview, at one point he just said, by God, you're a real pro wrestling fan because he was expecting me to be a fan of or knowledgeable about his work as Stone Cold Steve Austin in WWF. And the reality was that I had known about him since he was way back in Dallas. And I talked to him about some of the specifics of that, those territory uh, shows that I had grown up loving. And he said, by God, you're a real pro wrestling fan. And in that moment, Candace, something happened. I realized if presumably the biggest badass in professional wrestling could accept me for who I am and embrace my knowledge and love for professional wrestling, there wasn't a damn person who could tell me that I did not belong. So as a result of that, I dove headlong into doing professional wrestling interviews and writing about professional wrestlers who, by my estimation, are just as much pop culture icons and celebrities as any musician, Oscar winning actor or playwright. So I dove into that realm. And at one point in time, one of the individuals that I had contacted about arranging an interview invited me to be part of one of his localized shows here in San Francisco area. And that started the ball rolling. It was first, I started out as a timekeeper's girl type of thing. And then the second show I went to, I just lost control, darling. And I just dove right into the ring. Um, and ever since that, I we brawled our way to the back and then I brawled my way to the top of the card. So that's how it started. And when things actually went into overdrive for me, was during the pandemic. So many people feel that the pandemic really derailed them. Mm -hmm. But for me, the pandemic offered me an opportunity to sit down. It stripped away all the distractions in my life. And it allowed me the, to question, what is it, Pollo Del Mar, darling, that you are not doing, that you've always wanted to do? And why aren't you doing it? And the answer was that I'd always wanted to go full force into professional wrestling. And that gave me time and opportunity to do exactly that. And now I am here working with Game Changer Wrestling and the National Wrestling Alliance, along with many local promotions, uh, coast to coast. Mm -hmm. And like you said earlier, you're living your dream. You're doing exactly what you've always mm -hmm. wanted to do. You know, let's talk a little bit about NWA, such a storied institution of a promotion. You have a major role and a major presence there. And, you know, we see you both on social media and on the programming. And, and it's just fabulous to see what you're doing and the history that you're making. What's it like for you being a part of National Wrestling Alliance and, and working along so much so much talent such as yourself? It's legitimately, and I don't say this just because of the fact that I am actively involved with the promotion, but I pursued the National Wrestling Alliance. That was my dream 
really, because when I was growing up, WWF at that time was, of course, um, very, very prominent as it remains today. But the National Wrestling Alliance was where my favorites always resided, all of my favorites. And they pulled from the territory system that I had watched. The Jim Crockett promotions of old would bring in a lot of that talent. There was a lot of talent sharing from NWA and the territory system of the South, specifically the Southeast, which is kind of the area where I had resided as a child. So it was always my dream, always my dream to be part of the National Wrestling Alliance because while other people presumably would only aspire to go to WWF. I wanted very strongly to follow in the footsteps of people that I had seen and loved. People like Baby Doll, who I had the opportunity to meet finally in person. We've known each other for, for quite some time, but Baby Doll, the iconic perfect 10 who I met finally at NWA 74 this, this um, past summer. People like James J. Dillon, Ditto, saw and met him at NWA 74 this past summer. People um, who I have yet to meet or work with, but my personal all-time favorite manager, Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express. The Midnight Express, both versions uh, under Jim Cornette were the, I think, the determining factor of my love for not just professional wrestling managers, but my love for tag team wrestling. So it was always my dream to work there. And then thankfully, as the fates would have it, Mickey James contacted me a little over a year ago, the legendary Mickey James, who I'm so blessed to call a friend at this point, um, contacted me and invited me to be part of Empower. And that, you see, once you let me in, like I knock and if once you open the door, I mean, I just don't leave. They could not shake me after Empower last year. And here we are this year. Mm. And and you were leading Jamie Senegal, the wonderful Jamie Senegal. Mm -hmm. And that was three in the making, you know, being the first transgender athlete to compete in NWA. And, and you that correct. were part of that historical moment. I mean, what was that experience like for you, you know, getting out there to the ring and, and really seeing the fans and, and really recognizing just how big a moment this was for everyone involved. It's often something that I tell people, Candace, that people like Jamie and I, and so many others in the industry, we are pursuing our own passion, our own dream of being part of the world of professional wrestling. And that is so personal. It's very selfish. The reason I do this is very selfish. I want to be the, in this industry. It's my dream come true. The unexpected flip side of that is that when events happen like Empower, where we know that Jamie Senegal isn't just another wrestler wrestling on this amazing show, that for some people, Jamie Senegal is a message, um, an affirmation that who you are, no matter who you might be, your dreams are also possible. Mm -hmm. That history is being made and progress is being made in society so that people like Jamie Senegal can compete at the highest level, which her talent supports and her identity should not prevent. It was also the first time that, and people would argue this, but a bona fide drag celebrity persona was part of this world as well. Now we have seen historic instances of men dressing up as to poke fun or emasculate or things like that, but I don't do that. This is my like, this is my presentation. This is, it's beyond a gimmick because I've done this for 16 years as a career. And now I'm doing it at the highest levels. I'm doing presentations and presenting my type of a character for the very first time in the world of professional wrestling. And the fact that it's happening in the longest continuously running oldest existing professional wrestling organization in the world, the National Wrestling Alliance is historic and groundbreaking. And did I set out to do it for that reason? No, but am I unbelievably grateful that if somebody is going to do it, that I have that opportunity to change things and set a new bar and standard? Absolutely. Mm. And you mentioned 16 years, that's such a long time, especially to be <laughs> in business and to thrive and continue and sustain. And 
you know, we're going on 17. Soon it'll be 20. Soon it'll be 25. Who knows? Stop going aging on? me, woman. Stop <laughs> aging me. At 16. You said 16, but we have to praise that because this industry I'm is 16, out. honey. There it is. There it is. And this industry is so cutthroat. And what you've just stated in terms of making history and being able to lead the charge with someone like Jamie Senegal, that's historic and that's beautiful. That's something that we should certainly praise. I mean, when it comes to the role of the wrestling manager, and you've seen managers come and go within your time in the industry and both outside of it, watching managers on television and so forth, you know, what are your thoughts about the role and how it's perceived today? Do you feel as though wrestling managers are underrated? And if so, why? I think that professional wrestling managers at the largest scale are underappreciated and underutilized. Mm -hmm. I think that the role of the professional wrestling manager is so beneficial. We can talk for those who can't talk. We add color and personality. We allow storytelling options. These are all things that people do not think of necessarily. And they are tried and true tropes that we've seen for generations in the world of professional wrestling. I mean, we can go back to some of the earliest instances at the highest levels in the, the late 60s, early 70s in WWF, where Arnold Skyland was out there managing people and you know we were we're looking at people like the grand wizard these incredible personalities that have carried on generationally but in today's generation people who are doing what we do what i do um they're few and far between at any scale above maybe a localized promotion now on a personal level i know many people in this bay area alone where i reside um, and I work most of my work here in California. So I know many people in similar capacities. But once you move beyond the localized level, I think that we're very underutilized. I'm so glad. I'm so glad, again, to be part of some place like the National Wrestling Alliance, where we are plentiful. There are many managers. And then you juxtapose that, Candice, to Game Changer Wrestling, where I am also a fairly significant presence on occasion. And I'm the only manager really in that company. Mm. Why do you think that is exactly? I think that um, potentially it depends on where the promoter's mind is on, on utilizing professional wrestling managers, where they have historically seen us or perceived us. Quite often, it's the personalized taste of somebody who's doing the booking or paying the bills. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So where would you like to see the industry go when it comes to wrestling managers? Of course, it sounds like you, you would like to see more utilization, but is there anything else in addition to that in which you would like to see uh, the wrestling industry progress when it comes to the wrestling manager? I am less intrigued by the thought of what the professional wrestling industry does with managers and more intrigued by what I am going to do as a representation of professional wrestling managers. I'm in the National Wrestling Alliance with real Billy Silas Mason, and I want to see Silas Mason with some NWA gold around his waist sooner rather than later. I am more interested in guiding money, power, respect, Marco Mayor and Fabuloso Fabricio, and the agenda, which consists of Dark Sheik and Anton Voorhees, to championships along the coast of California and beyond. I'm more interested in potentially guiding a tag team into next year's Crockett Cup so that mm -hmm. I can prove my dominance in the National Wrestling Alliance. And I look forward to challenging myself against some of the great managerial minds who are obviously present and extremely active within the National Wrestling Alliance because I think that steel sharpens steel or iron sharpens iron. And when I had the opportunity to go head to head against legends like Father James Mitchell or Austin Idol or G's or even Danny Deals and others who are plying their trade within the National Wrestling Alliance, I will not only become better at what I do, but I will prove myself to those who question what benefit someone like me can be as both a wrestling manager and the influence that someone quite literally like me can have in the world of professional wrestling. 
Mm, can't argue with that. I cannot argue with that. You know, I'd like to think that the relationship between a wrestling manager and the client is delicate. You know, it's it's fragile and, and you really have to honor it and, and nurture it. For you, what do you look for in a wrestler that you'd like to manage? Like, what are those key traits and, and how does that really look for you vision wise? I think that one of the most beautiful parts about the clients I've represented, if you look at them across the board, is that each and every one of them does not need, does not need a mouthpiece. Too often people want to represent people for whom they can be the mouthpiece. And I certainly love being that because I have a lot to say, darling. But the fact of the matter is that they do not need that from me. I look for people who have that specific charisma, the ability to present themselves. I look for people who are driven and hungry. I look for people who are unique and I specifically look at people or for people who I feel have been under respected and underutilized prior to my coming on board because that allows me to take someone who might have always been just on the cusp of success and prove to the world at large that what I see in them, the vision that I have for them is something that with my guidance, they can actualize. So I think that that for me is one of the biggest defining factors. I think that the other defining factor is if you're going to be the manager of champions, someone has to have that championship quality. I am not going to take on any charity cases. I'm not gonna work with anybody who will not put in the same amount of effort to succeed or be victorious that I would. And I am looking for people who are willing to do anything necessary to take our collective team to the next level. Mm, that's profound. That's definitely profound and very good to know. I love that. You know, what's the legacy that you'd like to leave behind Polio as a wrestling manager, but also even just with what you're doing at PWI as a wrestling columnist? You know, that's that's another dream job for a lot of people and you have it. it so what legacy are you trying to leave behind? Oh man, it's it's challenging, I think, to think about what the legacy you would like to leave when you are very immersed in the doing. You know what I mean? I'm very immersed in the doing right now. But when asked that, there are a few things that come to mind. First and foremost, in terms of my contributions as a manager in the professional wrestling industry, I'm often drawn to memories of my childhood where I always, always, always from about 10 years old on had subscriptions to Pro Wrestling Illustrated in a variety of other magazines in the, mm -hmm. from uh, the wrestling world. And in each of those, there would be pull out photos, like full page pull out photos. And as a young child, I had a wall in my room where I would pull those photos out and I would tack them up the same way that people might put up their favorite band or, or any other collectible. And for me specifically, there was an entire section of that wall dedicated to the most iconic and beautiful women of a generation. The, the Miss Elizabeths, the Baby Dolls, the Dark Journeys, the Missy Hyatts, the Nancy Benoit, the individuals who um, were phenomenal in-ring talents at that time, the Wendy Richters and the Leilani Kais. So I had this wall of, of these beautiful women and I always recall looking back at those photos and their, the looks that they presented in those magazine photo shoots to me are so legendary that I could remember, oh, that is the outfit that Baby Doll wore the night she turned on Dusty Rhodes. Oh, that's the outfit that Sherry Martell wore at SummerSlam 92. Those kind of things. So in a very superficial sense, one of the things that I always think of when I'm putting together looks for big shows or looks for um, major events in the world of professional wrestling, I always think to myself, would this look be captured and iconic, iconized, like become iconic in the pages of Pro Wrestling Illustrated? Mm -hmm. So that is something that I would like to de definitely do, to have an entire catalog of these amazing iconic looks. The other thing that I would like to do as a professional wrestling manager is etch my name in history 
alongside some incredibly talented individuals with title victories. Like I said, one of the things that was my biggest goal as a child was to manage a tag team in the Crockett Cup. Now, I told that to, um, I told that to oh, Billy Corgan, <laughs> and Billy said, oh, you're, you're barking up the right tree. You're playing in the right sandbox. And I was a little known fact, I was actually supposed to manage a team this year at the Crockett Cup and travel being what it was at the early part of this year fell through for me at the very last moment. But in 2023, I will walk. I will walk to be at the, at the Crockett Cup. So that's something else I would like to do. In terms of Pro Wrestling Illustrated and being a contributor, When I first reached out, well, backtrack. When Kevin McElvaney, the editor-in-chief of Pro Wrestling Illustrated, reached out to me initially, it was because he had seen a tweet. And in that tweet, I talked about my childhood, wanting to grow up and be a columnist or a contributor. Hmm. And we talked privately and um, we con coordinated. I contributed my first column or my first article, rather, about a year ago. And at that time, I jokingly said, hey, I grew up loving Eddie Elner. Eddie Elner doing the heel perspective throughout the 80s and into the 90s, followed by Brandy Mankiewicz and others. And I said to him, if you ever need a new generation Eddie Elner with a twist, reach out to me. And it was a ha 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 moment. And then I'll be darned. Six months later, he reached out to me and said, hey, are you still interested in that Eddie Elner piece? Are you still interested in that place? So two things to take from this. Number one, closed mouths don't get fed, darling. So open your mouth and speak out into the universe what you want. So it may come true. But secondly, if I am able to create any kind of a lasting legacy as a contributor to Pro Wrestling Illustrated, I would love it to be with the kind of fond memories I look back on previous columnists. So for the readers who are fans today of our work, I hope they remember me as fondly as I remember some of the people that contributed throughout my childhood. And look at Kevin McElvaney making dreams come true. Like, look, you know. I know. I love that. I love that story. I'm so glad you shared it. And I'm so happy that you're a part of the team. It, it really is a treat reading your column on heels. And I, who doesn't love a heel? You know, it's I'm having Absolutely. recently, and it seems like everyone would rather play the heel, the villain versus the face or the good guy. And I can't like, I can't fault that. It's fun. It really is fun. <laughs> it is more fun to, and it's also, I think that the reason that people secretly love heels mm -hmm. is because none of us can live up to that goody two shoes business <laughs> that people expect of us. I scarcely play uh, an, a turned up volume of myself at ringside, darling. I'm gorgeous. I'm stunning. I'm devious. I'm a little bit underhanded. I will go to any lengths to get what I want. And if you can see yourself in that, good for you. And if you can't see yourself in that, you're in denial. <laughs> you're lying. Exactly. We all have lying a shadow to yourself. Side. We all have a shadow side. So, you know, some people like to bring it out a little bit more and we love to see yours. Polio Del Mar. I mean, and I gotta, I gotta praise your your style, your your outfits. Every time I see you, they're just I'm in awe. You have some of the best style in the business. It is impeccable. I would love to know who are your style icons that are not in the wrestling business. Well, interestingly enough, none of my style icon icons are in the wrestling business. I certainly um, think that for me. Fashion is in style is so individualized. If you're watching the National Wrestling Alliance and you're seeing the variation of Poyo Del Mar there, the prettiest girl in the Holder and South, the lovely Poyo Del Mar, and Thrill Billy Silas Mason, honey, you are seeing a, the very epitome of some of my greatest fashion icons of all time. People like Dolly Parton. You're seeing people like Anna Nicole Smith, a beautiful. Um, and tragic woman from a Texas trailer park who was stunning beauty took her to the height of Hollywood success. And people like JLo, JLo is an eternal fashion icon. So I look at all of those people, but in outside of the National Wrestling Alliance, I get a lot of my style from the 
truly stunning women that were rolling around on the hood of a firebird in the 1980s. That's who I am, honey. I Right now, I'm telling you, if a firebird pulled up in front of my house at this very moment, Candace, <laughs> I would dash out of here just to roll on the hood. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd hope... <laughs> I would be so jealous not being there because I would love to see that, to be quite honest. That would be just- Well, the insurance company wouldn't love it once whatsoever if a 220 pound loveliness rolled around on the hood of your car, but you can take that up with Geico. Exactly, and, and there it is. Exactly, they can handle it. It's all good. You know, Polio, thank you so much for being a part of this series. I couldn't have done this series without you, to be quite honest. You truly are- a living icon. You are inspiring so many people and I'm sure inspiring those especially who would love to be in your shoes and would love to be a wrestling manager one day. What advice would you give to those individuals that are seeking to follow in your footsteps? Who? What advice would I give to those who are dreaming and aspiring to become a professional wrestling manager? I think that you have to understand that in the world, it's not just in the world of professional wrestling, in the world, there are going to be many people who question whatever it might be that you dream of or aspire to do. And there are going to be far more people who tell you no than who tell you yes. And if you personalize each and every time you're told no, there's a strong likelihood that you're going to stop pursuing that dream before the one person that needs to says yes. So for me, I put in the work, I do my work. I do everything I can because I cannot control what the outcome of other people's decision-making is gonna be. And when people say no, I say, thank you. I put it away for a little bit. I'm probably gonna go back to that person to see if they change their mind. And I just keep asking because what it took was exclusively just one person to say yes. That one promoter, Robert Hoff, Butch, who allowed me to come and work with him at Wrestling for Charity, a very small, nothing corporate company here in, in Northern California. And that led me to doing just enough things to somehow, some way, pop on the radar of Mickey James who became the next person at a major level to tell me yes. It allowed me to um, come onto the radar of um, Effie, which brought me in to do Big Gay Brunch, which changed my life. It brought me on the radar of Zicky Dice, who I met at my second show ever at that little promotion here in Northern California, who's the one who convinced Effie to put me on Big Gay Brunch. Those things, and then obviously you just build on small victories, and many small victories make for one huge victory. And be prepared because you don't know when that's going to happen and you won't have time to get ready. So don't get ready. Stay ready. And keep asking until the right person says yes. Mm -hmm. I love that advice. I'm going to take that advice for myself as well. It's, you it's, do, girl. It's very wise. You know, at the end of this, we have to ask, what do you have coming up? You know, please plug away. I have a feeling you have a lot of things percolating, a lot of stuff going on with NWA as I can see on the programming. So this is your time to let us know what's happening. Well, first and foremost, I need you to all follow me on social media. My Instagram is Pollo Delmar Fans. My TikTok is Pollo Delmar Fans. My Facebook is Pollo Delmar Fans. The only thing that's truly different is my Twitter, which is the Glamazon PDM, which P.S. I had before Beth Phoenix. And then I'm also on Twitch as Just Poyo Delmar. I stream old school wrestling. Please join me for that. On October 30th, depending on when this broadcasts, I will be at Devil's Night in San Francisco for the Underground Wrestling Alliance, which is my home promotion where the agenda and Money, Power, Respect, and I are going to run rampant on October 30th at Devil's Night 17. And then after that, you can always look for me and find me ideally on upcoming episodes of NWA Power broadcasting every Tuesday on Fight TV, and again on Fridays at 3.05 Pacific Standard Time, 6.05 Eastern Standard Time on NWA's YouTube. Look also at NWA USA every Saturday noon 05 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on NWA's YouTube channel. We are getting ready to be filming episode, or season 12, 11 or 12, 
of NWA Power and, and season four, I think, of NWA USA very soon. I think that everyone now has more than gotten on board the Poyo and Silas Mason train in NWA. I never thought that audience response would lead to our um, move up the card, if you will. But I do think that people have fallen in love. They've gone from confusion and misunderstanding to actually appreciating that Silas and I are such a unique pairing, honey. And we could just be your neighbors next door, girl. <laughs> the neighbors that can beat up our tails, basically. <laughs> mm -hmm. You wouldn't like us because our yard is messy. We, don't, we always almost cause a fire with the grill and we're sometimes fighting the night, but honey, it's okay. We're nice. Hey, I would love to have you and Silas as neighbors though. It would, it would definitely put a spark into my everyday. It's pretty quiet here. So having you both as neighbors would be a treat, but until well, that's that. What they, call us. they call us a spark in the park. Here you go. Trailer. <laughs> But we love you here, Polio. It's It's been such an honor to finally get to meet you, to interview you. You know, I admire you so much. And we all appreciate what you're doing, not just within NWA, but within the wrestling industry at large. So thank you so much for your times, your talents. And we can't wait to see what else is in store for you in your career. Thank you so much for having me here, Candace. I love being part of Pro Wrestling Illustrated, the extended family. I love the fact that Recently, I was at a street fair here in San Francisco and somebody came up and said, I love your column and Pro Wrestling Illustrated. I was shook because that was the last place that I expected to get that. But mm -hmm. I'm always grateful and never lose sight of the fact that I'm truly living my childhood dreams at this very moment. And you having me here is a big part of that. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Polio Delmar. Thank you all for watching this latest episode of Face Turn with Candice Cordelia, where we have been interviewing some of the best wrestling managers in the wrestling industry today. Don't forget to follow Polio Delmar on all social media. You have no excuse now. You can go back if you've missed any of those plugs and definitely follow Polio on all of the different social media platforms. And don't forget to click like, subscribe, give us your comments. Let us know what you think about this interview and all the others that we have coming up in store. Until then, thank you so much for watching and continue to enjoy the wrestling.